greatest weapon that we as Christians have. A lot of times people say, well, what can I do? I can't do anything. I don't have money. I don't have an education. I don't have abilities. I don't have talents. Well, God has given to every one of us a, a gift, a call, and to all of us, there is something, a mighty weapon, the strongest weapon that makes us the mightiest people on this earth. And a Christian need never to say, there's nothing I can do. We can do something. We can do something great. As great as Jesus did, even greater, we can pray. Intercessor, intercessory prayer for others is the secret weapon of the kingdom of God. It's like a missile that can be fired to any spot on earth. It can travel undetected at the speed of thought and hit its target every time. It, did you know that this missile of prayer can be armed for delayed detonation in his, in his prayer recorded in John chapter 17 Jesus said John 17 20 I do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe in me through their word did you know Jesus prayed for you when he was here on this earth that's what it says here his prayer spans the centuries and embraces all who have ever believed or ever will believe. Every time somebody turns to Jesus Christ, the prayer of Jesus is answered again. 2,000 years ago and still being answered. The implications of that are staggering. We too can pray about things yet to happen. Things, for instance, in the lives of our children and our grandchildren and their children. We can wrap them in the arms of intercession and march them through the fires of hell and into the gates of heaven. This is the inheritance we can leave our children, an inheritance of prayer. Prayers lifted to God long before they were born and prayers answered long after we have gone. Now, have you ever realized that? You can pray. Pray for things yet to happen. Pray for your children, your great-grandchildren. What a, what a legacy you could leave. But there's more. Satan has no defense against this weapon. Satan does not have an anti-prayer missile. Now the unbeliever has many, many defenses against our evangelistic efforts. He can refuse to attend church. And even if he does attend, he can shift into neutral. And he can look up and count the cracks in the ceiling. You can go to his home but he doesn't have to let you in. You can hand him a gospel track on the street. He can throw it away. You can go on television and preach the gospel and he can change the channels. You call him on the telephone and he can hang up on you. But he cannot prevent the Lord Jesus Christ from knocking at the door of his heart in response to our intercession. People we cannot reach any other way. We can reach by way of the throne of grace. But we don't intercede by default. That is because there's nothing else we can do. Some people dismiss prayer as a weak alternative to practical action. In other words, a lot of people think prayer is an excuse for doing nothing. You got to get out there and get into action. Why waste your time praying when you could be out there 
on the front lines. Hmm. <coughs> Some people <coughs> think that offering to pray for someone is nothing but a graceful way to excuse ourselves from an awkward situation. In other words, that's our exit line. Well, I'll be praying for you. And that's the way out. Well, it's true that we can do more than pray. And it's also true that there is nothing more we can do than pray. Because intercession is the heart of redemption. Isaiah said of the suffering servant, the Messiah who was to come, Isaiah 53, 12, he made intercession for the transgressors. For Christ, intercession was more than praying. His birth was part of the intercession. His life on earth, his public ministry, his teaching, his miracles, his agony in the garden, his scourging, the mocking, and the shame, that awful dying on the cross. All this was intercession. For him, becoming a man was an act of intercession, and that has not changed. The work of redemption is still the work of intercession. Jesus is interceding. The Holy Spirit is interceding. And we share in that intercession because God has made us a kingdom of priests. Now, intercessors have influence in high places. As God prepared to bring judgment upon the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? When God was angry with Israel, you know, shall I hide from Abraham? Because you know what happened. Abraham interceded. And when God was angry with Israel, he said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he destroy them. Intercessors have influence in very high places. God has always sought intercessors. Someone to stand in the gap before him for the sake of the land. But you know what? God has always had a hard time finding intercessors. In Ezekiel's day, God looked for a man to stand in the gap. The breach that sin had made between him and Israel. But he found no one. Isaiah tells us that God looked for a man but found no one and wondered that there was no intercessor. And today God is still looking for people to stand in the gap. I want to take you to <clears throat> Jesus himself and look at his secret. It's not a secret. It's all there for us to read and to learn from. But I want us to look at Jesus and his experience can be ours. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus taught his disciples, gave them the, his final words, They're first in the upper room, then on the way out to Gethsemane. And <clears throat> it had been an, an unsettling evening for the disciples. They were bewildered by some things. Judas had been acting very strangely. And uh, there was a, a conversation between Judas and Jesus that they didn't understand. And even Jesus, we read, was troubled in his spirit. Jesus was talking in riddles. He spoke of leaving them. And he said something about his father's house. They tried to understand, but it was difficult. And the more Jesus told them, the more confused they became. Listen to what he said to them in John 14, 7. If you had known me, Jesus said, you would have known my Father also. And from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip, it was too much for Philip. 
So Philip broke the silence of the disciples and he said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And see, Philip seized upon Jesus' words about the Father and he was saying to Jesus, well, give us a more definite word. Give us an unquestionable vision. We want to see not just by faith, we want to see by sight. That would be enough even if Jesus left them. Now in his answer to Philip's question and request, Jesus disclosed the secret of his life and his work. And he indicated that that same secret would be the secret of their life and work. Now listen to what he said. In John 14, verses 9 through 11, you want spiritual authority? Here it is. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Now Philip had just made a request. Show us the Father, as though he had never seen him. But Philip had seen him. He just didn't know that he had. He had. Every time he watched Jesus heal a leper, he saw the Father. Every time he listened to Jesus teach, he was hearing the Father. But it looked like Jesus was doing those things. It sounded like him too. And Philip was confused. Now here's what Jesus is saying. Now dear friends, listen very carefully because what was true of Jesus is true of you. And here is the source of all authority. Jesus was saying, I am not the source of my own sufficiency. The things that I said, the things that I did, they did not initiate with me. I did nothing on my own. It was the Father. In other words, Jesus was not taking any credit for his words and his deeds. He said, those were of the Father who dwells within me. Jesus was telling the disciples, I am not the source of my own power. This helps us to understand what Jesus meant when he said in John chapter 5 verse 19, listen carefully, John 5 19, truly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself, but what He sees the Father do, for whatever He does, the Son also does in like manner. Then in verse 30 of John chapter 5, Jesus repeated, I can of myself do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. All right, he said the same thing in John chapter 8, verse 28. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. He repeated it in John chapter 12, verse 49. I have not spoken on my own authority. But the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. Now, a few minutes later, Jesus would say to his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 18, I will not leave you destitute. I will not leave you as orphans, literally is what he, it says. Now, that was exactly what they were afraid of being left like helpless orphans. They couldn't bear the thought that he might leave them. Now, he'd been talking a lot about that. 
You remember, every time Jesus brought up the subject of the cross, they tried to change the subject. And Peter, up at Caesarea Philippi, even rebuked Jesus for talking about the cross. They must have thought, we've been such a failure with Jesus, what are we going to do without him? But listen to Jesus. He's saying to them, I am not the source of of my own authority I'm not the source of my own sufficiency the explanation of the miracles that I worked and the words that I spoke is not found in me the explanation lies with the father he did it he did it through me but he did it now here it comes Jesus says listen to me Philip the secret of the works is not my physical presence. And if the secret is not my physical presence, then my physical absence won't make any difference. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, if you'll just trust me, the works that I have done, you will continue to do. And you do even greater works than these. You think that my leaving you will finish everything. It will ruin my work. You think it will make it more difficult for you. But my elevation to the right hand of God will enable you to do through my intercession greater works than I have done. My presence in heaven and the Spirit's presence in you is the pledge of greater power and greater work. Philip, the redemptive purpose of God will not miss a beat when I leave. You'll pick it up before it touches the ground and you'll carry it on. As the Father dwelt in me and did the works, He'll dwell in you and do the works through you and not the father only but I also will come and dwell in you do you know what Jesus is saying he is saying the same authority that enabled me enables you Hallelujah! you have the same authority that Jesus had isn't that what he says I didn't do it it's the father in me and he said, the same Father that indwells me, indwells you. And not only the Father, but I also. And this is why Jesus has said greater works. Here is his secret. Here's our secret. This is the basis for the extraordinary promise that he gave to them. Most assuredly, he underscored it. He said, I... I, I want to be sure you get this. I'm going to underscore it. So most assuredly I say to you, the one who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And the promise is to whom? To the apostles? Well, yes, to the apostles. Only to the apostles? No. What did he say? Jesus qualified it. There's one criterion. He who believes in me. That includes you. That includes you if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. To those who believed in him, Jesus promised two things. One, he said they will equal his work. And two, they will exceed his works. And 50 days later, in the very city where the Lord was crucified, the disciples did both. After 10 days in the upper room, the disciples emerged with the power of the Holy Spirit upon them. And after a short sermon by Peter, 3,000 people were added to the church 
Now, as long as I can remember, we've been trying to do it again. But it seems that the Pentecostal power has continued to elude us. I don't know of many Christians who would be willing to say that the church is living up to the promise of John 14, 12. So the question is, why not? If Jesus said, we've got it, we either haven't used it, or we haven't understood it, or we don't believe it, or something. So, why? Well, let's understand some things. Jesus talked about greater works. And the key, I think, the real key is found in the phrase we often overlook. Because I go to my Father. Jesus makes it very clear that the greater works he's talking about can be fulfilled only if he returns to the Father. Why? Why was it necessary to ascend to the Father before the disciples could realize this promise? The ascension of Jesus was not essential to the working of physical miracles. Jesus had been doing that for three years. But this new thing that Jesus is talking about demands that he first ascend to the Father. He's talking about something new, something on a higher level, something in a new dimension. The promise cannot refer to a more continuation, or a mere continuation, or a even acceleration of what had already been going on for three years upon ascending Jesus would send the Holy Spirit now at this point I want to take you to a couple of scripture references and show you something that mystified me for years in John chapter uh, 7 verses 38 and 39 Jesus said anybody comes to me and thirst I will give him the living water John chapter 7 notice in verse 38 <clears throat> he said he who well verse 37 if anyone thirsts let him come to me and drink he who believes in me as the scripture said out of his heart will flow rivers of living water now if you've got a red letter edition of the bible you'll see those words in red Jesus is speaking but look at verse 39 they're not in red this is the explanation of John the apostle who's writing this gospel he explains Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given why because Jesus was not yet glorified now for years I was mystified by those words I couldn't understand because the Holy Spirit's an eternal part of the Trinity the Holy Spirit was present at creation the Holy Spirit inspired the writing of the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit empowered the prophets. And yet here is John saying the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. I, I had problems with that until finally I understood what Peter was talking about on the day of Pentecost. Look what Peter said in Acts chapter 2 verse 33 Peter tells us what John was talking about Peter said therefore being exalted to the right hand of God that's Jesus being glorified having ascended into heaven and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit he poured out this which you now see and hear now what does it mean? It means simply this. 
that what previously had been reserved for a few spiritual superstars like Daniel and Isaiah and Ezekiel and so on was now the common prerogative of every believer in Jesus Christ. That's what he said. Peter goes on to say a little bit later, he said in verse 38, repent and uh, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You'll what? You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, for the promise is to you, you people here at Pentecost, and to your children, and to all who are far off. That includes Gentiles. And finally, as many as the Lord our God will call. Dear friends, what has Jesus told us? He said, the enabling power in my ministry is the Father. It's not me. I'm not the source of my own sufficiency. It's the Father in me. He said, when I return to the Father, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And that same power that enabled me will enable you. It's not reserved for a few spiritual giants. It's, it's for all who will believe in me. Jesus is emphasizing in John chapter 14 the union that it will exist between them although they will be separated physically. He's going away, he said. But I'll remain with you. Not physically, of course. It's necessary for me to ascend in order that I might return. And if you'll just trust me, the work that I started will continue and it will even increase. His physical absence will not diminish his work. Actually, it will enlarge it. It will increase it. In other words, when they work, it will still be Jesus working. His works will be their works. And their works will be his works. I want to show you a verse of scripture that to me is the one statement that separates Christianity from every other religion on the face of the earth. Now, every other religion on the face of this earth regards its founder as having lived and taught and left behind some teachings and some followers. He died and is gone. And uh, that's it. His work is finished. But the Bible says that Jesus only began his work when he was here on the earth. Look at Acts chapter 1 verse 1. This is the verse that sets Christianity apart from every other religion on the face of the earth. Now Luke wrote the third gospel, the gospel of Luke, and he also wrote the book of Acts. In the first verse, he's referring to the gospel of Luke that he wrote. The former account, that is, the, the gospel of Luke, I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus, what? began both to do and to teach Luke says Jesus only began his ministry when he was on this earth now he continues his ministry how? through you through spirit filled believers those who believe in his name those whom he indwells so here we have the works of Jesus and greater works of Jesus that depend on, on what Jesus actually is doing in us and through us. The greater works of the disciples depend upon the going away of Jesus. His ascension into heaven, His enthronement at the right hand of God will mean the descent of the empowering Holy Spirit and the inauguration of Christ's heavenly intercession. 
and enables the church to fulfill its mission of evangelizing the world. That brings us back to the question of why a great part of today's church is not living up to this promise of greater works. The best place to find the answer is in the promise itself. How did Jesus intend for us to realize this promise? Now notice in John chapter 14 verse 12. He promises us that we would do greater works. But what's the very next word he spoke in verse 13? I want you to notice. The first word in verse 13 is a very simple conjunction. What? The word and. And he said you'll do greater works than I've done and that connects what he's about to say to what he's just said the promise here's how you'll fulfill this promise he said and whatever you ask in my name that I will do that the father may be glorified in the son now notice again verse 13 begins with the conjunction and don't ever take as a complete text any verse that starts with and because it isn't complete. And at the beginning of a sentence lets us know that what we are about to read is a continuation of or a completion of the thought of the preceding sentence. So this is not this and does not mean I'm going to change the subject. No, I'm going to continue the thought. I'm going to finish. And the works, he said, the works that I do, he will do also and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. Now that's why I say to you, this is the mightiest weapon we have. This is the mightiest weapon the world has ever known. Prevailing prayer. You see, the greater works of verse 12 are to be accomplished by the believing prayer of verse 13. It's through prayer that we equal or excel his works. The book of Acts is filled with prayer meetings. Prayer surrounded every act Activity of the early church take another look at the believers gathered at Pentecost they prayed 10 days they preached 10 minutes and 3,000 people were saved today we pray 10 minutes preach 10 days and we're surprised if anybody gets saved but remember Jesus said that we would do it the way he did it. His secret would become our secret. Did Jesus pray much? Was prayer a conspicuous part of his life? Now if Jesus could say and do only what he heard and saw the Father do, don't you know he had to spend a lot of time listening to and seeing and conversing with the Father? And he did. I want you to look at a recognizable rhythm in the life of Jesus. He would withdraw to meditate. Then he would go out to minister. Again and again, this pattern repeats itself. The, listen, what you see Jesus doing in his public life, all the ministry he did, all the miracles, all the teaching... The public life of Jesus was supported by his private life with the Father. And I want to say to you, an individual Christian or a church is only as strong as its prayer life. Only as strong. Prayer is the secret. It was the way of Jesus. It was the way of the early church. And it should be the way of the church now. Now, 
I want to come back to, uh, to a phrase that Jesus used here. <clears throat> Before I do that, let me just share with you that in one way or another, to one God or another, people have always prayed in some sense. We've always been devoured by the need of something outside ourselves, beyond our reach, and something spiritual or something supernatural, a place to run to, someone to cry out to, someone who takes notice of our predicament. We long to escape the sense of a crushing fate and the feeling that all things are or just crushing down among us. Prayer is more than a religious exercise. It is a human necessity. Now I say to you that prayer and the Christian life are synonymous. To say that I'm a Christian is the same as saying I'm a person of prayer. What is prayer? It's to connect every thought with the thought of God. It's to look on everything as his appointment. It's to submit every thought, every wish, every resolve to God. To feel his presence in conscious fellowship. Now Jesus has just said the church would do greater work than he had done. Most assuredly I say to you. He who believes in me. The works that I do. He will do also in greater works. Than these shall he do. Because I go to my father. And he added. These greater works as will be done. Through prayer. These words were so astonishing. That Jesus repeated them. I mean. How can we believe what he's just said. He wants us to be sure and get the message. So he repeats, verse 14. Yes, I repeat it. Anything you ask for, as bearers of my name, I will do it for you. And as a matter of fact, during this last meeting with his disciples before his death, in John chapters 14 through 17, Jesus repeated these same words six times. Now, if you don't believe something Jesus says the first time or the second time or the third time or the fourth time, try six times and maybe it will get through. Jesus said six times, if you ask, I will do. In this simple statement, Jesus sets forth prayer as the primary human factor in the accomplishment accomplishment of God's program on this earth I tell you what we look at the news and we hear about all the the expansion of of um, other groups hostile to the gospel of Jesus Christ and terrorism and all kinds of stuff we wring our hands in despair and say what can we do about it? Well, here we're told what we can do about it. With a startling boldness, Jesus asserted this, this, that, that God's action, God's divine action, in some mysterious way is based upon believing prayer. I've heard people say, well, well, God's sovereign. God can do anything he wants to do. Well, I believe that. But I know this too. God himself has ordained that within his sovereignty, he set it up that he responds to the prayers of his people. What can we do? Listen, we got the mightiest weapon on earth. The mightiest weapon in heaven. If God's people individually and corporately all over the earth would unite in believing prayer you'll see a change you'll see a reversal Jesus sets forth prayer right here 
as the, as the chief task of the believer. It's the believer's responsibility to ask. It's God's responsibility to accomplish. If I had to pick out one verse in the Bible, just one verse that most adequately and concisely defines prayer, it would be John chapter 14, verse 13. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. All right, we have seen Christ's promise of greater works. Now let's look at what kind of praying by which these works are done. Just some basic principles and illustrations. I want to want to slice this verse up like a loaf of bread and the first slice is this whatever you ask whatever now that word whatever sets the boundary of prayer this uh, <clears throat> I was visiting an old friend a, a preacher and uh, I said well, how's it going? He said, oh, my wife is, uh, she's in the bedroom and she's suffering from a migraine headache and she's really been having a terrible time. I said, have you prayed for her? Well, no. And I said, well, look, uh, why don't we go in and anoint her with oil and pray for her? He thought I was joking. And, and later I found out, that he told the story, that while I was there, I said I could go in and heal her. I said, no such thing. You know, I, all I did was suggest that we pray for her. It never occurred to him that he could go lay hands on his wife anoint her with oil and pray for her what does Jesus say here about the boundary of prayer whatever whatever there are people who say well I couldn't pray about that does that fall under whatever whatever sounds to me like it includes all of our needs and all of our concerns To the question, what can I pray about? Jesus said, whatever. John chapter 15, verse 7. Listen to this. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. The Bible tells us we can pray about everything. When speaking about prayer, the Bible uses big limitless words for example how about Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3 call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know now that phrase mighty things literally means things that are hidden inaccessible fenced in in other words Prayer knocks down the fences. Nothing lies beyond the reach of prayer. There are no boundaries to the jurisdiction of prayer. Prayer is always relevant. If a thing is big enough to be concerned about, it's big enough to pray about. Whatever is your concern is a concern to God. Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 and, and uh, the last part of verse 5 goes with it. It shouldn't be a verse division there. He said the Lord is near. Then he said don't worry about anything. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything. Then he said pray about everything. Now that's a good formula. Don't worry about anything pray about everything you got nothing and everything worry about nothing pray about everything 
Prayer touches both ends of our lives and it covers everything in between. Now, the second slice in this loaf, in this verse is, in my name. Whatever you ask in my name. Now, Jesus several times uses that phrase in chapters 14 through 16 of John. Let's look at some of them. John 14, 13. Whatever you ask in my name. John 14, 14. If you ask anything in my name. John 15, 16. Whatever you ask of the Father in my name. John 16, 23. If you ask the Father for anything, He will give it to you in my name. John 16, 24. Until now you uh, have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive. John 16, 26. In that day you will ask in my name. Now I want to clarify something here and I want to try to make this as, as simple and as clear as possible. Because, dear friends, here is your authority. Right here. With these words in my name, Jesus signals a new stage in his redemptive work and a new dimension in his relationship with the disciples. He promised them. He just promised them that they would do greater works because I go to my Father, he said. Until he ascended to the Father, his redemptive work was incomplete. Only when he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high would the promise be realized. So having by himself made purification for our sins, we're told, he has become our mediator. Jesus is the executor of his own testament. Jesus has taken up the reins of authority. He sat down. A work is ended and a work has begun. The work of the cross is ended. All the shame, the suffering, the sacrifice. Jesus said, if you call on Christ to save you, he will. That's true, he will. But <clears throat> there's more here. The work of the cross ended, but the work of the throne, intercession and mediation has begun it's through Jesus that now we come to God no longer in the name of sacrifices but in the name of the sacrifice no longer through the mediation of earthly priests but now through our great high priest who has entered into heaven there to appear in the presence of God for us. Now to make up for his physical absence, Jesus promised the disciples three things. First, he promised them his peace. John, 24, uh, John 14, 27. Second, he promised them the paraclete, the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16. Third, he promised them prayer in his name. John 16, 23 and 24. Praying in the name of Jesus. What does it mean? I want to tell you that it means much more than what we have understood. What's so special about this? Praying in the name of Jesus. Well, it means not only praying in his name, it means living in his name. I can tell you that. First of all, because Paul says in Colossians 3.17, Whatever we do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. Now, here is how we ordinarily pray in the name of Jesus. Most of us use it consciously or unconsciously as a magic formula to guarantee the success of our prayer. Don't we ordinarily close our prayers with the words, I pray this in the name of Jesus. 
as though this guarantees the success of the prayer. Well, I want you to know that repeating this phrase is not a magic formula which guarantees the success of what you've just prayed. And not every prayer that includes those words has actually been prayed in the name of Jesus. There are a lot of prayers that include these words that are far from praying in the name of Jesus. So we've got to understand what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is not a secret code that works some kind of magic spell when you repeat it. Like Shazam or Open Sesame. The name of Jesus is not a tool to be manipulated. All right. I want to share with you about three or four things here. First of all, name means the person himself. Name is identification. Name means essence. We, we, we do this, recognize this when we say of somebody, he has a good name. You mean his name's Sam, he's got a good name? That's not what we mean. We mean the person himself. Jesus is totally identified with his name. His name signifies what he is, what he has done, who he is. In Luke chapter 9 verse 48, Jesus said, Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him that sent me. To receive somebody in Jesus' name is like receiving Jesus himself. To recognize his name means to recognize what and who he is. I'm leading up to something here. But let's look first at Romans chapter 10 verse 13. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, does this mean Jesus saved me? Yes, but it means much more than that. If you call upon Christ to save you, he will. But the word call here, the word call on the name of the Lord, it means to acknowledge that Jesus is what his name says he is. Lord. This verse is saying the same thing as verse 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, that is call on the name of the Lord in verse 13, believe in your heart that God is risen from the dead, you will be saved. His name is Lord, and what is he is what his name says he is. Lord. And all who acknowledge him as Lord, call on his name, will be saved. All right. So what does this have to do with prayer, praying in the name of Jesus? Simply this. Dear friends, if you are actually praying in the name of Jesus, you are praying in accord with the nature and the character of Jesus Christ. In other words, you're praying exactly as he would pray. You are praying in harmony with him. Your name is essence. It's character. It's who you are. So to pray in the name of Jesus is to pray exactly as Jesus would pray. You know him. You know his character. You know who he is. You know his purpose. So your prayer is in accord with him. In harmony with him. Name means a second thing. Name means representative that is that you are acting as his representative <clears throat> A, an ambassador in another country acts as the representative of that person of, of that his country 
so to pray in the name of Jesus is to be on earth his ambassador his representative you're acting on his behalf name means a third thing name means authority Christ has given us the right to pray in his name because we are his representatives and we ask as his representatives because we are about his business and we act with the authority he's given us. Let me illustrate it like this. Here's a policeman at a busy intersection. The traffic light is out and he, he's directing traffic. And I've been to other cities, other countries where there are no traffic lights and the policemen, have you ever been to India and some of those, I mean, traffic coming from everywhere. But here's a policeman right there in the middle. He puts up his hand and the traffic stops. Now, does he have the power to stop that traffic? No, he does not have the power to stop those vehicles. They could run over him and flatten them in a moment. He does not have the power. Does he have the authority to stop? To stop the track? Yes, he does. The government has given him the authority. He may not have the power, but he has the authority of the government. So to pray in the name of Jesus is to pray with the authority of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to give you something to think about. Now, you may disagree with me, but you think about it at least, okay? Did you ever notice Jesus never prayed for anybody to be healed? Did he? Did you ever read? Show me where Jesus said, Oh, well, how about raising Lazarus? He prayed. Oh, well, he wasn't praying. <laughs> now listen. What did Jesus what did Jesus do? Be healed. Be healed. He declared it. Be healed. Now I want to say another one. Do you ever read where the apostles prayed for anybody to be healed? Oh yeah, they prayed, and they prayed for understanding. They prayed the, yes. But what did they do? In the name of Jesus, be healed. Now please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you should never pray for anybody to be healed. I didn't say that at all. Because the Bible teaches us to pray for one another and to pray for the sick. And so I'm talking about led by the Spirit of God and knowing the authority of Jesus Christ, that we act in that authority. And with that, that's all I'm, I'm saying. But I, let's bring all this together then. I told you three things about the name of Jesus. What are they? The name of Jesus is Jesus himself, his nature, his character. So to pray in the name of Jesus is to pray in harmony with, with him. Pray exactly as he would pray. I told you that name is means representation. We are representatives of Jesus. We're acting in his name. And name means authority. A, a policeman will say, I arrest you in the name of the crown. Right? I've got the authority to do it. Now let's bring all of this together to pray or to act in the name of Jesus is that we're doing it by his authority with his approval and we're doing it in a way that's consistent with his character as expressed in his name let me share this with you can you steal in the name of Jesus can you kill somebody in the name of Jesus can you commit adultery in the name of Jesus? That's inconsistent with his nature. Jesus would never grant you authority to use his name in any way inconsistent with his character. So to pray in the name of Jesus 
is to be there in that situation as its representatives and to do exactly as he would do to pray exactly as he would pray and you know what all that means it means simply this it means to pray according to his will and the Bible tells us that whatever we pray according to his will and that's the same thing as saying praying in the name of Jesus and I tell you Jesus told us the truth he said every prayer prayed in his name would be granted did Jesus ever pray a prayer that he never expected to be granted Jesus prayed in a way consistent with the will of the Father. And so, to pray in the name of Jesus is to pray according to His will. That is, we're asking for His approval consistent with His nature and His character and His purpose. And therefore, when you pray, it's just as though Jesus Himself was praying. You're praying exactly as he would pray we're making the request but it's like Jesus that's our authority when Peter and John healed the crippled man at the gate beautiful of the temple Peter said to him in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth get up and walk and the crowd of people were filled with wonder and amazement they ran towards Peter and John and Peter responded to the people. He said, why, why are you amazed at this? Why are you wondering as though by our own power or our own godliness we made this man walk? But I don't have the power to heal. The power to heal is not a prize awarded to me because I'm a godly person. No. It's the name of Jesus. I may not have the power, but I have the authority of the name of Jesus well dear friends I want to tell you this kind of praying requires something on our part it requires a godliness on our part a likeness to Jesus an understanding of Jesus an acquaintance with him an intimacy with him and it requires diligence on our part and Paul pleaded with the Christians at Rome that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. And that word strive is a word from which our word agonize comes from. Wrestle in prayer. Agonize in prayer. Struggle. Fight. Prayer is the secret of Jesus and he passed it on to us. But not all Christians receive it. The secret of greater works is received only by those who say I believe God will do his greatest works through my prayer. And I want to say to you in your ministry and in your own service, in your own life, Never, never undertake more Christian work than can be covered in believing prayer. Don't undertake anything that cannot be covered by believing prayer. Otherwise, you're going to be acting in presumption, not in faith. Father, I just pray that we'll all grasp what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. And I pray, my dear God, that we'll not just pray to take up time and, 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 and pray superficially. I pray, Lord, that we'll understand what it means to agonize in prayer. And, 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 and Lord, really to be in harmony with your will. And to be so sensitive to the Spirit of God that we'll know that when we say, I pray this in the name of Jesus, we're not just repeating a phrase. 
that we are actually expressing expressing what is true about us thank you lord amen amen